Most people listen to podcasts to learn something, to be entertained and to walk away feeling inspired, perhaps even educated a bit. Hello, I'm Devo and I'm one of the two hosts of our show, The Little Impolite Podcast. Welcome and thanks for listening. This show is for the expansive, open-minded creative whose persistent curiosity towards integrating new information in their lives never stops. Think of it as the free thinkers toolkit for anyone that refuses to enroll in the conformity of all of those around them, instead forging their own paths with fortitude and love. It's that slightly unapologetic conversation with that new friend you just met that sort of wistfully and effortlessly pushes the conversation into spaces that you never expected. It's the deep-hearted conversations with purposeful and thoughtful individuals that have finally figured out their superpowers and are now pouring into it with gusto and love. We're delighted to host these conversations with you that lead us down the conversation well. But watch your step, because most of our guests, and of course, Lisa and I, are a little impolite. Hey there. Welcome to the show. So this is our first official show. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Lisa. Hi. Um, Our our first official rebranded show. We used to be mind body business, and now we are a little impolite. And so, Matt, we have a fantastic guest on tonight, and Matt's already here with us. You can see him on the screen, and we're live tonight on LinkedIn, live on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I want to just sort of briefly introduce, actually not briefly, because it'll take me about an hour to introduce all of his accolades. But Matt Lacroix, he is a writer, a philosopher, a scientist. Uh, I first came across Matt about two years ago. Um, I was listening to a Paul Wallace podcast that he had done, and Paul Wallace is a fellow historian, scientist, et cetera, that I think you're well familiar with, that uh, I think you're good friends with as well. Yeah, absolutely. And he was doing a podcast with this guy named Matt LaCroix, and uh, and you you have this boyish age. And when I first saw you on the YouTube screen, I, I thought he's like 16 years old, and he's dropping knowledge from like an ancient sage. And I was like, who is this guy? So I quickly Googled him. And then I went down the rabbit hole for about an hour and a half through YouTube, found him on his YouTube channel, started following him, um, have been listening to him ever since. I've read both of his books. He has a third book coming out. The one I'm reading right now, again, for the second time is The Stage of Time. Um, just a little background on, on Matt. So he wrote his first book at 22 years old. So that sort of kind of tells you what sort of immense figurehead we're talking to today. Um, his, his book centered around quantum mechanics um, super string theory, which is like, beyond. what were you doing at 22? That's the question, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I, just, I had just entered college, hadn't I? Yeah. Uh-huh. N- not super string no. or quantum physics. That's for sure. Um, the thing that really fascinated about me about Matt is as complicated as the topics that he discusses, he breaks them down so that lay people, plebeians like myself, can really clearly understand. But the cool thing about it is he presents information that sort of forces you to investigate it a little bit further. So he drops all of these really esoteric knowledge and these pieces of literature that forces you to sort of kind of Google it and figure out like, wait, what did he just say about the plebeians? Or what did he just say about Atlantis? And he's going to talk a little bit about all that stuff. Um, At 32 years old, he published his second book, which is one I just talked about, The Stage of Time. And I believe, Matt, you're writing your third book now in cooperation with somebody else. Is that correct? Yeah, the third book is uh, – my side is almost done. I'm writing in conjunction with Billy Carson, who's another pretty big name in our field. And we get labeled – it's kind of a ridiculous name, but we're um, alternative – ancient history researchers, or as the uh, mainstream calls us, pseudo-archaeologists. Um, and we dabble in everything from, as you mentioned, understanding the nature of reality, physics, uh, quantum physics, the, the the smallest form of particles and vibrational frequency to, you know, how old is our story? How sophisticated were these ancient civilizations and how sophisticated are we? It's a very interesting set of concepts that actually all fit into each other in a very holistic way. And so I'm looking forward to getting into some of those conversations with you tonight. So the centerpiece of the conversation, thank you, Matt, will be 10 ideas that will just blow your mind about the history of humanity and the origins of origins that we've been taught. So our entire lives have been taught the theory of Darwinism, whether relig- whether you believe in a religion or not, the ideology around religion or the dogma around religion. And, and he's going to dive into 10 ideas that are literally going to disintegrate everything that we've been taught. And he's, the cool thing about it is it's not just sort of his 
superstitions or his theories. He has data around all of it. And most of this data is suppressed and hidden from us for reasons that he's going to discuss. Um, but I want to say one thing before you jump in and just kind of jump into some of our questions. I don't think a lot of people have ever introduced you this way. And, and one of the one of the impressions I have about you, Abe, thank you for agreeing to be here. But I listened to a podcast, a podcast of yours about six months ago, and you were on it with about four or five other men. And all of you were presenting your ideas, and everybody was sort of fighting for airwaves and, and their <laughs> theories. And there was an argument that ensued. And you had been quiet the whole show, and I just kept waiting. I was like, when is Matt going to jump in? When's going Matt going to jump in? And finally, instead of jumping in to try to prove yourself to anyone else, and this is what I absolutely love about you is your modesty and your humility. Thank you. You jumped in, and instead of presenting and trying to prove someone wrong, you said, gentlemen, if we're going to do this show and have any sort of a constructive, constructive conversation, everyone needs to take the time and the respect and the decency to listen to each other. It's not an argument. Everybody has their context. Everybody has their theories. Everyone should have the opportunity to present that. And I was blown away by that because most people of your intellectual capacity and the other people that you sort of were sparring with, if you will, on that show, or you weren't sparring, but they were, everyone was out there to prove a point. And you just sort of laid back, let people do their thing. And I was like, this dude is the real deal. And that's when I first started thinking about how I could get you on the show. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's really cool that you did that on on so many levels, and it says a lot about you. And I'm I'm really excited to kind of dive into some of the questions that we have for you. It's a little it. it's a little bit sorry, and I'm talking a lot, and I'll let you have the mic. It's a little <laughs> this show is a little bit different than a typical show we have on our show, but the new concept sort of centers right around that. So I'm really excited that you are kind of the inaugural keynote speaker on this show. So thank you. Wow, it's an honor. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. So first question we're going to dive into, again, 10 ideas that will blow your mind about the origins of humanity. And the first question that I learned and as I've started digging down this rabbit hole about five years ago, which led me to you, was that human civilizations were told roughly, roughly they started recorded human history and correct me on my numbers around 6,000 years ago, but were basically told that the original humans were only, I think, 20,000 years old, roughly. Is that correct? Am I right about that or are my numbers off? Well, it depends on if you're if you're talking about how they talk about like the pre-Homo sapien sapien, like getting into Denistovian and Neanderthal. There's that's where the disconnect comes in, where we're where we're looking at this. We're like, okay, well, what are we? Are we just one of these pre, these pre-hominid Neanderthal Denisovians, or is there a lot more to the story? And that's where that timeline. What we're really talking about here is not when pre-humans ever ever started and existed on the planet, but when did civilization begin? And when did we go from being hunter-gatherers to something that's much more sophisticated? And that story is actually recorded in ancient tablets and texts around the world and in, in stories, and it's not anything like we're told in books. It's completely different, and there's a reason why that is the way it is. And I, I don't know if you want me to just keep going or you had to follow up on that. No, I don't have a follow-up. So that first question is, the, is how old, based upon your research and your science and your data, is human civilizations? And sort of, if you may, kind of tell us where it all began from your perspective. Sure. And I would yeah. like to know as well, sorry, as we load you with questions, the reason why we're told a different story. Yeah, it's um, it's a quite an interesting history of how this all got started. Um, basically, the beginnings of all of this was, I guess you could say, a certain group of intellectuals, um, part of certain secret societies. And esoteric secret societies go back thousands and thousands of years. The some of the first ones um, we know of were in were in Babylon, and they were part of these groups that were priests and high in, um, high knowledge individuals that knew a lot more than the rest of the population. And they realized that one of the the biggest threats that could exist is us truly understanding what we are and what we how significant we are to the the planet and the universe and so much more than we know and all of that information though is not just someone's perspective it's been recorded in ancient text for thousands and thousands of years earlier than we even have or, or it's admitted in school on when on when civilizations were sophisticated basically what we need to do is have an understanding of science and geology and climate for like we were taught like don't just reject all of it like have a basis for, for some of those things but then be open-minded to say well maybe this thing isn't quite right and maybe this isn't quite right and we need to rethink about how these pieces fit in 
And I just want to give a, a brief example of that before I talk about where civilization started. In school, I remember being um, very almost depressed with the idea that we're just this primitive, this, this advanced ape that somehow through Darwinism rose up through survival of the fittest. And here we are just sort of conquering our world and that consciousness was being derived from the brain. And that's really what school teaches us. Now, the, the, the thing to mention about school is that the entire education system in the United States was developed by the Rockefeller institution. Now they have, there was a curriculum that was basically developed where this is how you have to talk, talk about biology, you have to talk about, um, talk about history. You have to talk about all, all these things have to be in this laid out format. And if the teacher was to be like, well, wait a minute, I don't know if I really like fully agree with that. And if they were to try to not teach that same version, they would lose their, their, their license. They would not be able to teach. And so what you have is really all, and I know there's some amazing teachers that are out there that sort of push the limits a little bit and get people to critically think a bit. I know that does exist, but it's not the norm. Typically, you have a teacher that's just spouting off this regurgitated information that's the same as every other teacher. And that's why people have that, that curriculum is so well established. Well, that curriculum was very carefully decided. Okay. And that's the the, the biggest point that needs to be understood here is that if you have a system of a society where people are doing all the various jobs that we're doing and we're living this various life, we have to have a perspective that goes from, well, what are we? What is consciousness? What is our significance here? And that plays into the entire scheme of how we view reality. And it plays into our understanding, well, okay, if we're just um, superior to to all the, the animal kingdom and we've gotten here just by being into, like super smart and um, some people think like, you know, eating a bunch of magic mushrooms and all of a sudden like some apes thought up of new things. No, that's, that's not what this is at all. There's a whole nother dynamic that we're going to get into. And I don't want to start with that because I think when we get to number eight uh, top uh, on the top 10, we get to number eight is really when we're going to get into that conversation. Cause I don't, what the problem is if you throw too much information at someone in, in an unorganized fashion, they're going to reject the message. And so what we need to do is we got to layer this on top of each other with evidence driven content to understand, well, what is this great story? Um, is are things much different than we're told? And the more that other individuals, if they're open-minded and they're able to just allow an idea to fester and see if there's any merit in it. And then maybe and obviously go research for yourself. Anything I say, I highly hope that anyone goes and looks it up themselves because you don't, it doesn't matter who it is, me or anyone else. You don't just take anything for face value. You go and you look yourself, but we got to understand that you got to be very careful to look. And I know I'm going off on these like tangents, but there's a, we have to create a foundation first before I start talking about this. Main can I, can I interrupt one second for real quickly? So this conversation that we're about to go into is especially relevant for you. And, and I say this not because you don't have the entertainment of the same ideas that I do. Lisa grew up for roughly 30 years in a, in, in a Mormon church, which the ideologies around that are very strict on the beliefs of creationism and Darwinism. Yeah. And, and when you were saying 6,000 years, I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's what we were told. So it's the earth it, was created, blah, blah, blah. So it's that. really, so mm -hmm. it's fantastic mm -hmm. that you're starting off with this baseline because okay. most people, Lisa's not the minority in that belief, right? Like we live in this Western society that is based on this conditional ideology of one God, okay. one religion. Blah. So I love where you're, where you're starting this off. So sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay. No, awesome. That, that's good to expand on that. And yeah, what we're, really, really we're talking about here and you're, you dabble down, it's, it's known as the rabbit hole and it's a term that's used way too much, but it's really the best way to look at it because the more you look into these little pieces, these nuggets, the, the deeper you get down in. Before you know it, you're so far down it that the old paradigm of reality has now shattered all around you. Now, I want people to not be afraid of that. You know, what is so, why are people so afraid to entertain a new idea? If anything, you're going to feel a lot better when, when you're listening to what I'm about to tell you about who we really are, because it's going to completely go against the mundane version that we're told. Even certain aspects of religion and Darwinism combine to create this very false narrative on, on who we are and, and how far back our story goes and how amazing we are. We are, and that's the one of the highlights and the emphasis of this whole show, and that's the reason why the entire Education Institute, which is basically a condition mind control, has been created. Because people, if they knew the truth, 
of who of what we are and how significant we are to the entire cosmos, they wouldn't want to do mundane jobs. These jobs where they're they're going and they're working all their their time and then they're coming back and having these little snippets of free time and then they realize like their whole life has been wasted. And I know that the pandemic has caused people being at having a lot of free time to start questioning that. And I know that's happened a lot, a lot of places around the world where people have all this free time all of a sudden. They're like, what have I been doing? And they start reevaluating their life, what happiness is and what really what we could be doing here instead. So I know that that goes off on all these different directions, but so let's lay down some foundations. Okay. The foundations to lay down is we're told in school that human civilizations emerged 6,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent of Sumer. Now, that's the area of Iraq, the Iraq, Iran, Syria, that whole area, which has like been in conflict for years and years and years, right? And su subsequently, you can't go in there and, and excavate anything on an archaeological dig, which is very interesting that we may get into that to talk about as well. Because that really, even though that timeline of 6,000 years is, is very inaccurate, it did begin there. But it began there much earlier than that. And the idea we're going to get across here that I want people to understand is instead of a linear timeline, okay, instead of thinking, okay, we have primitive hunter-gatherers that are traveling around the world, and they're all independent, and then all of a sudden, boom, civilization comes up 6,000 years ago, and then there's one linear civilization that then builds off of each other, and here we are, the most sophisticated tear that whole thing down, throw it away, and just imagine for a minute what I'm about to tell you. Try to have an open mind and understand that instead of one linear timeline of a rise of civilization to where we are now, think about it more like civilizations have risen up from various influences that we'll talk about, and then fallen, and then risen, and then fallen at least three, four, maybe five times. And that is like an incredibly important point to get across. Go ahead. So I just want to recap what I just heard you say. So you're, what you just said is that civilizations, humanity as we know it, and we live in this little bubble of we're told 6,000 years or whatever, of, of, you're saying that the species of humans have existed before or some version of hominids have existed before in a completely different silo and, and time period that was wiped out three or four times and started anew roughly. Yeah, but not a not primitive though. That's the main point of this. Yes, hunter gatherers did exist. I'm not saying that didn't, but something happened. There was a moment in time when certain knowledge and information was put into those civilizations, and then you saw rapid rises that came out of nowhere. And then certain cyclical disasters have occurred on the earth. And we'll get into that in in later number down the line here that have been so severe that has literally destroyed those civilizations, caused them to all their knowledge to be almost wiped out, and then another civilization has had to build off of the remnants of that and then try to rise again. Now, every time that those falls have happened, it's the opposite of what we think. It's not that we've gained more, it's that we've lost more every time. Now, I'm not saying other civilizations were on the technological level with fast computers and cell phones and cars like we are now, we're talking about sophistication and knowledge on a completely different level, okay? And this is, that was a perfect example. Why don't you go ahead and bring that up? Okay, is this, this leads exactly into what we're talking about. What you're seeing on the screen, this is in South America, this is Machu Picchu, right? A famous place that most people have seen, This these mountain temples, you know, way up above 9,000 feet on top of uh, the Andes Mountains, okay? Now, we're told in school, again, this linear model, that the Inca created Machu Picchu, all right? And then the Inca slowly were wiped out when they were, when they were conquered by the Spanish, when they systematically conquered the Americas, right? When Pizarro came ashore with his armies, went inland, and then caused the demise of the Inca. Completely wrong. We need what we're looking at right now, and notice on the screen the different building styles. That's what I want to present to you. That's why when we as we talk about this, the civilizations that we're going to be talking about are called either the lost civilizations, the master civilizations, or the megalithic civilizations. And megalithic means very, very large stones. Okay. Now I want to just really quickly add something to this. 
Imagine what would happen right now if our civilization got hit by a catastrophe like a, a coronal mass ejection from the sun that blasted our planet and caused um, massive tectonic shifts and basically the, it wiped out our entire civilization, right, with tsunamis and just boom, volcanoes, and we were all wiped out, everyone, except small groups of people in these isolated pockets around the world. What would survive our civilization? I want everyone to think about that for a minute. We live in a civilization with these pretty, like, somewhat poorly constructed buildings um, that are some are stone, but a lot of them are metal, and metal corrodes extremely fast over time. It doesn't even last more than a couple hundred years if left alone. And then you have uh, what I would call us, like, the, the great plastic civilization, right? So if, if a thousand years went by, 2,000 years went by, and we were gone, and these small groups finally got together, right? and then the civilization was able to slowly rise up again, what would be left from us? What would they find from us? Well, I can tell you that we wouldn't have much because all of the technology and the paper, everything that we're kept knowledge is, is almost entirely digital, right? We have books, but we don't have other means to have a message be recorded and kept for a long period of time. If you write something down on paper and then you file it away somewhere, that is going to be gone in 500 to 1,000 years, gone. It's never going to exist again. If you paint something on a wall, on a cave wall, yeah, it might stick around for several hundred years, maybe a 1,000 years, but water dripping down and other things in that cave are going to probably wash that away. So then how do you leave a message behind? How do you leave a message that can actually be survive enormous amounts of time? And when we're talking about enormous, try to now wrap your head around, imagine a civilization that was a global, sophisticated civilization that connected all around the world that existed more than 13,000 years ago. And that civilization was wiped out. Now, what would survive that civilization? Go ahead and pull up that image again. So I do have one observation to make, and it's interesting because I yeah. had this similar conversation before you answer this. I had this yeah. similar conversation with someone recently before you answer this. And he was, we were having a conversation about cave drawings and he said, if these civilizations were so advanced, why would they not be able to create better drawings? And so my answer is, I believe what yeah. you're about to say. So carry on. The answer to that is that those civilizations that did cave paintings were primitive and they're not part of this group we're talking about. We're talking there. You're talking about nomadic hunter gatherer Neanderthal Denisovians that were you know, hundred, like hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then other groups that were more primitive along the way, because understand like even today in our sophisticated technological world, there are still groups in remote parts of the Amazon and in, and in islands in the Pacific that don't have anything. They live in complete isolation in harmony with nature. We still coexist with that. And they did as well. So there were other groups that were primitive that were writing on cave walls and such, but that doesn't mean that's the only story. Okay. That's why we're going to get into this. Now, look at what you're seeing on the screen right here. Here we have in Machu Picchu, these math, massive granite blocks. Okay. On the bottom most level. And then you have this very, very primitive, um, cobble and mortar built on top. Now that primitive stuff on top is younger, Right. And then the stuff on the bottom is way is much more sophisticated and older. But wait a minute, that doesn't make sense because if civilizations were primitive and then they became more sophisticated, then why would the most sophisticated be on the bottom? Think about that. Mm -hmm. That's that spark that goes off. And you're like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. So it's backwards. Then it's completely backwards. And that's where we're getting around to to understanding this is that all around the world we have these megalithic ancient civilizations that created these massive megalithic block temples and pyramids all around the world that are so sophisticated in understanding the um, alignments to the stars and our and energy centers of our earth that we still don't even understand how they did it or what or some of the reasons why they did it. But that those megalithic blocks and the ancient texts that we're about to get into, known as cuneiform texts out of the Fertile Crescent region, were, is basically all that survived. All that survived to these civilizations are those two things. So aside from the technology that you're about to talk about, my first observation when I first saw the pyramids of Egypt or any of these stones in all over the world is, A, the fact that they have 90-degree right angles, the fact that they're massive, massive stones that are tonnage in weight, 
and 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 the fact that the stratification of them where they sit in these archaeological digs not only are they beneath some of these more primitive stones that you're just calling out but they also go depth down architecturally like they're not just what you see visually there's there's architecture dug into the ground correct but these stones sorry i hit the screen too fast but the thing that blows me away is that the, these stones weigh tons and tons and tons. Exactly. And if anybody was primitive, how would they have been able to have the technology to put those in place in the first place? Thank you. That's a great point. That was exactly what I was about to get into. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. But I asked, so here's, let me just tell you one piece. Yeah. I asked my dad about this, and my dad was a staunch Christian, ha- really conservative, and made us read the Bible every night and interpret it. And with these, and I used to get, I'm like you, I used to question everything. And I asked my dad this question one time. I'm like 10 years old. And I said, if, wow. if primitive people built these pyramids, how these stones weigh tons and tons and tons. And if, if they were just ancient um, Egyptians who built those, how, the technology at that time was ba- barely the wheel. How did they get all those stones in place? And my dad was like, oh, yeah, there's not questions that we ask. You know, it's just God. Faith <laughs> right. of God. And I'm like, that doesn't yeah. make any sense. So, all right, yeah. carry on. Sorry. No, that's a great point. And that's, that's what we're getting into is I want you to wrap your head around, well, what does it mean to be sophisticated? Okay. All right. Look at our society today. People walking around on their, on their phones. In most cases, they're playing some like angry birds game rather than using the phone to learn every piece of wisdom they can. But I want to strongly emphasize in that idea of knowledge, you cannot be look in the mainstream. This is a tightly organized, tightly controlled thing. And this is where you start getting down the rabbit hole and conspiracies. Some people might roll their eyes, but imagine you're an archaeologist. You've spent years going to school. You like I want to I want to dig up I want to go to ancient sites and I want to uncover these places. You developed you spend an enormous amount of money. You spend years in classes and then you get part of this archaeological institution. If you don't follow the rules, just like a teacher in school, if you don't follow this main this mainstream viewpoint on how all of this aligns, you will be laughed out of your job. You'll lose your credentials and your all your, your life's work will essentially be over. That's why so many people in my field, we're not licensed archaeologists, because how could we be? We would be hampered by this 6,000-year timeline. Like, So look at these stones right here. I can tell you that those stones and uh, many others we're going to find around the world are proven to be over 13,000 years old when they were created. Okay, That means that our timeline of civilization is at least double, if not far more than double the age of what we know. Now, you brought up a great point, Devo, these stones. We're talking about multi-ton stones. In some cases, these stone blocks are so enormous, and, and not these aren't even the, nearly the biggest ones. You go to places like Baalbek, Lebanon that we're going to show after, or the Yangshan Quarry in China, or the Imperial, Imperial Wall in Japan, or um, all throughout Peru in, in the in the temple uh, in the valley of the temple um and, and all the way through machu picchu and south america and bolivia and so many other places around the world we're talking about some blocks that are a thousand fifteen hundred over ten thousand tons okay we can't even move those today with modern machinery and i want people to wrap their heads around that we can't if we if they take a crane Okay, the largest cranes we have, they can't move anything over like um, a couple hundred tons. And we're talking about s- blocks that are so big that we can't even move them today. Not only that, but here's the wild thing that is the evidence spark that is going to make people, okay, wait a minute, that makes sense. If civilizations are 6,000 years old, then the cultures that lived during this time had what are known as Bronze Age tools. That means that they had tools that are part of. Um, a certain hardness scale, okay? Like the copper and bronze tools, obviously. And so the idea behind that is if you have granite right here, look at that, Pete, those granite blocks. Go look up what's known as the Mohs hardness scale. Granite is one of the hardest stones on, in the world. And there's a reason they chose it because it has a high quartz content and it's extremely um, difficult to erode. So it'll last like forever, okay? There's a lot of reasons they chose it. But also, if you have bronze age tools, and you try to carve something that is harder than your the tools you're working with, you're not going to get anywhere. You can't even manipulate those stones, which means that they had technology and sophistication that we don't even understand. And none of those tools and none of the, those things are left anymore. 
They're all gone. So you have these mysterious sites around the world where there's just these giant, perfectly carved, like some of them, like in, in Tiwanaku in, in Bolivia, are so sharp on their angles, uh, carved out of a thing called and andesite, that you can cut your finger on it, and it's over 13,000 years old. That's how incredible they were able to cut some of these stones and build these places that are just in ruins all around the world. And so I just want to add to this. Look at this picture just one more time. What this means is that that civilization that created those that lower foundation, that incredible, sophisticated master civilization, they were wiped out in a catastrophe, gone. And then the, the actual Inca we think of came out of the Amazon jungle, right? They found these giant remnant blocks all around the plate, the world or around the, the region. And they tried to recreate it and they couldn't, but they knew that these, these sites were sacred and important, but they just could not recreate their technology and, and knowledge. And that's the emphasis I want people to understand. So another thing that, I, and if you're going to touch on this, just let me know, and I won't go down to go down this too far. But in some of the pyramids and in some of the references you've made all around the world, these stones are so precise. Not only are they heavy with multiple tonnage, but their cut diagrams are so sharp and so tight that in some cases you can't even fit a piece of paper in between some of the cracks. And furthermore, I, I listened to one of your podcasts on the astrological formations of each of them, that they're all in perfect alignment with star, astrological starscapes, et cetera. And, and, and I was, are you going to expound on any of that? We're going to get to that on number three when we talk about the pyramids. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but yes, don't Just, worry. I'll, we'll we'll cover all of those as we go along. But I, wanna, I don't want to go jumbled around too much i okay, want to be able to build i want to build foundations for people as we get there but yes so let's go ahead and go to number two and we can talk about um how sophisticated some of these civilizations were i only have you for an hour so i'm trying to squeeze in literally every single it's okay we can, we can go a little over if we need to yeah okay no 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 worries okay so here is the wild thing there's a concept called geodesy okay geodesy represents these certain points around the earth where these, these energetic areas, um, this is also a, a relatable term called ley lines, which is basically that, okay, well, he, he, here's what's wild about it, right? The earth is just an energetic sphere, okay? Don't think of it in just its physical way. Think about it in an energetic way. So anything that occurs with the earth, and we'll get into that we talk about cyclical ca catastrophes, anything that's going to be physical on the earth has to happen on an energetic level first, okay? So it's a giant energy sphere is our planet that's why there's a wobbling north and south magnetic pole which everything feeds into on this harmonious ener harmonious energetic state okay when you look at geodesy which means these points that align up around the world there's an area of the 30 degree parallel 20 and 30 degree parallel where you see that well wait a minute so instead of civilizations building these structures because there was water nearby or it was good for them to farm and then they created these, these structures? No, not at all. In fact, you look at a place like Tiwanaku and Pumapunku at well over 12,000 feet elevation in this incredibly arid place with no resources, and yet they build all these structures there. Why? When you map out these energy centers known as ley lines, convergence zones of energy on the earth, and you map out these specific locations um, that they were building on these lines that had to do with energy again, energy, energy, energy. You find out they were all built in these perfectly mapped spots around the world. So rather than being by accident, they actually created them all in specific places. Okay. Now, can I, can I interrupt for a second? Cause I want to go back to those ley lines because that has a lot of criticality to a lot of the stuff that's gone on in early, in early the geo, Sorry, in the archaeological formations, right? Can you elaborate real quickly on what ley lines are? Because I know a lot of people don't okay. know what that means. So imagine you have a, the Earth as a sphere and you have a magnetic north and south pole, okay? Mm -hmm. And they have this balance of energy. It's called electromagnetic energy that's around the planet. Those, there's energy lines, literally the energy that focuses along these specific lines. And where those energy places converge, that's where you get a ley line. And when those energy convergence areas, you can harness that energy and use it for certain purposes, okay? And they knew uh, far more about energy in the cosmos and our planet than we ever know right now. Like, that's what I'm saying about their sophistication. Yeah, we may have cell phones and computers and, and various things like that, but our level of knowledge on these areas is, is minuscule compared to them, okay? Minuscule. 
How would you map a ley line then? That's the that's the point. And we're as we get into the pyramids and we get into this understanding of where these are, how do they know that? How do they know where these places were? They would travel great distances just to build these temples specifically because of the locations that they're on. So if anyone was to like go type in ley line map of the earth right now, and you'll see where these ancient sites are around the world, you see that a lot, most of them line up to either ley line convergence zones or geodesy points. Basically, like not like think of like the equator is like halfway through the earth. Well, you're talking about these parallel lines that relate to energy on in other in other ways, like above or below them, and it has to do with again energy of the Earth. Now, what we have on the screen is a place in that proves, without a doubt, that these civilizations are older than thirteen thousand years ago. And you're not going to hear this in history books, in in school at all, because it's very much um, it's pseudo archaeology. Okay, so in 1995. Uh, a German archaeologist named Schmidt came into Turkey and found this incredible site up on a hill. Okay, and and when they were and they, by the way, this entire site since 1995 has only been excavated five percent of it. Five percent. What they found was there was these underneath massive amounts of soil. They found these enormous T-shaped pillars, multi-ton, giant T-shaped pillars. And there's all these bizarre, very integrately carved um, symbols and, and animal-like creatures all over them, right? So you think, oh, well, that's just animals on the earth. No, not at all. What we're really looking at here is the largest and most sophisticated cosmic library on the entire planet. So in the image right there on the left, that's known as Pillar 43. And you see the vulture on the left and how he has a, a ball in his hand and how there's a scorpion below him. That's That, that represents the, the constellation of, of Cygnus and then Scorpius down below it. And the ball above it is a star called Danib, right? This is an astronomical library. They were mapping the cosmos. Okay, and they knew the alignments of where the cosmos, uh, these constellations would align up to what's known as the precession of the equinox. So important to understand. What it means is our Earth wobbles on its axis. It's not straight. It goes like this. It, I can't. You can't see me. It, it wobbles like this. Okay, and what that means is the zodiac ages, not your birthday, but the actual zodiac ages represents the way that the Earth is facing certain constellations over a 2,100-year cycle. Now, that whole cycle, as it spins around, is called the Great Year, or the precession of the equinox. And it means that an entire rotation of the Earth is about 26,000 years and faces these different constellations during that time. Why would they have wanted to know that? Wow. Well, turns out that there are cyclical cat catastrophes that occur on the Earth every 13,000 years. So if you're a civilization and you know that the most important thing you can preserve is knowledge, you would need to track not only energy of the cosmos, because that also plays an effect. And I don't want to pretend it's just these other effects. There's, there's energy of the cosmos that relates to when you're facing different constellations and planetary alignments that have to do with consciousness, of course. But they're also tracking these catastrophes. And they know that when it comes, they're going to have to preserve their knowledge, because if they don't, all the knowledge, the subsequent knowledge that the entire civilization was able to, to amass could be wiped out. And then, and then there'd be nothing for the following civilization, if there was a civilization, to then build off of. And that's what Gobekli Tepe is. I, I have a question. So you said in the outside of the call that civilizations actually, in, in the terms of their advancements, denigrated over time. Yes. So one civilization created this, which means some sort of information would have had to been passed down to them that there was a cyclical 13,000 year catastrophe. How would they have known at this time period that every 13,000 years there was a catastrophe looming or pending, et cetera, if the information denigrated over time? Yeah. So that's where that's, that's the key point to make. And I, that's great. When they first found this site, it was buried under enormous amounts of soil. Okay, and it's been calculated that it it took as long to bury this site as it did to create it. Wow. How would a civilization bury a site in, in that took that much time unless it was the only way to protect it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Furthermore, because that site was buried under enormous amounts of soil, the organic matter, which is you can't you cannot date rock. That's why any I don't care who what academic tells you a site is a certain age. 
they're, they're trying to date rock. It, it's all, it's not, it's all inaccurate. It's not true. The only way you can date is through organic matter. That's it. Or ice core samples. That's the only two things you can do. So when this site was buried over by soil and it was all protected, the organic matter, the small little tiny bits of organic matter that were able to stay in the cracks of these giant pillars was able to be preserved. So what did they do? They radiocarbon dated the organic matter in multiple spots, not just one, in multiple different pillars of this site. And they came up with an age that this site was built at least 11,800 years ago, at least. That immediately throws the civil, the date of sophisticated civilizations more than double through evidence-driven radiocarbon dating. I mean, we know that. And so what that means is that we're the first civilization to come along to dig this up and then learn about this. But it's been guarded and hidden because if people think about this whole thing, why is all this being hidden? Why? Number one, we're way more sophisticated than we've been told. Our story is much older. And two, if they learned that these ancient civilizations knew about cyclical catastrophes, people would be freaking out right now because we're exactly 13,000 years ago from when this last event occurred. And that's a whole nother discussion that we can probably briefly touch into at the end, which is where the newest book that I'm going to be writing after the one with Billy Carson is going to be focused on. Okay. So say that one more time. We're at the end of this cycle. We know that because of yeah. astrology, we can study that. Yeah. We, we understand that scientifically speaking. So technically speaking, this cyclical effect, which repeats itself roughly every 13,000 years, we know for a fact that we're approaching that end of that 13,000 years. That's cycle. right. So theoretically speaking, everything, and I'm not trying to be doomsday here, but theoretically speaking, the earth, whatever chaos is going on right now, there could be an impending cataclysmic disaster. Is that what you're getting at? Except, except it goes, it goes much deeper than that. The Maya predicted, and again, the Maya were way more sophisticated than we've been told. The Maya predicted that there would be a future time when a civilization would be, have the technological means to be the first ones to ever survive this, this, this cyclical catastrophe in history. And we are that civilization that has the technolo technological means to survive this. Wow. And I, and, I, and, that, and I can tell you all the evidence on how that's going to happen and what they're secretly doing to prevent this. But it's called the global elites that know all about this, the, the, the fat cats at the top that make the real decisions, and that very much exists. If people don't believe it does, just go do a little research. There are a lot of very powerful individuals that know all about this, and that's one of the reasons why this information has been taught to us in the way that it has. Because if people knew what was potentially going to happen, they would be freaking out right now. But I will tell everyone so that people don't freak out listening to this, that there are very specific and secretive things that are going on right now that, are, that, is, that I believe will be successful in preventing this. For the first time in all of the different versions of, of the, we've come along, we will be the first ones to not have a reset. Okay. Wow. It's a cliffhanger. No. All right. Carry on. <laughs> My mind is just like. Let's go ahead. You're going to be up all night, aren't you? We'll be like, yeah. Let's go ahead and go to number three now. Jesus. Apparently, didn't have anything to do with this. Is this the right? Okay. You want you, this? One, right? You can. You can go there. Um, but. Yeah, and don't forget, we have to go to the other slide that, that goes along with it as well. So which one do you want me to do first, this one or the other one? You can start there, and then we'll, and then we'll move over to the other one. So um, again, I know this is going on, so I'll try to like, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So the, the Great Pyramids of Giza, right? Some of the most sophisticated and incredible structures on Earth. We're taught in part of that wonderful Rockefeller education system in history books that these were built by the dynastic pharaohs of Egypt, like Khufu, um, to basically be tombs, okay? The problem is... And that's like the way they describe them, right? Oh, so these were built by to, uh, built four thousand years ago, four or five thousand years ago, to be tombs of um, of these pharaohs, right? And so that is the whole purpose behind them. That's why they were made. So don't ask any more questions, right? <laughs> the problem is, there's never been a pharaoh ever found in any in any of these pyramids. Okay, number two, there's never been any writings ever found either. When they say that Khufu's name was on a stone block. 
um, I want to give you an example about that. Let's say there's a statue that is down the road from here that someone spent a lot of time, this beautiful statue that, that, that they made, right? And I go and I spray paint my name on that statue. Matt was here, right? And then thousands of years go by and then they find that statue. They're like, oh my God, Matt, the great conquering hero built this statue. Did I build it? Or did I just put some graffiti on it and then they misinterpreted it? That's what they found with Khufu. They found one single area in the Great Pyramid where it mentioned Khufu that someone had that a, a pharaoh had written into a wall, and then they used that as justification that Khufu built the pyramid. Guess what? There's absolutely nothing in that pyramid that has anything to do with a tomb. In fact, it's the very opposite. Those structures are the most sophisticated ancient structures on the entire planet. They compose of 2.3 million stone blocks make up the Great Pyramid with an average weight of 10 tons each. Okay? So if you're thinking right now, imagine a civilization that we're talking like the Egyptians have these slaves with 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 pillar uh with pulleys and these wooden blocks and they were hauling these in. No, no, no. Not only that is impossible, but we could not build these today. Furthermore, there's specific air shafts that were, were created above these massive stone blocks that are like 30 feet above um, these rooms, which I, we have no idea how they even got those into in place. But they're these shafts. They're not air shafts. They're just shafts that point out to the stars that align to specific star constellations. But not only that is they don't line up anymore. So if you take procession of the equinox, like I said, the wobbling of the earth, right? And you put it into a computer and you calculate when the Great Pyramid of Giza, what's known as the King and Queen's Chamber, when did they align to the constellations of what they are? You find out that the King's Chamber aligned to the Orion's Belt, which is what those three stars are. It's actually a literal representation of the three belt stars of Orion. That's, that's, these, big, that's these big bright stars up above. Right. Right? Yeah. But not only that, but the, the, the King's Chamber was aligned to Orion's Belt well over 12,000 years ago, potentially even 36,000 years ago. That's how procession works. You have to go back another entire procession, okay? Furthermore, the queen's chamber is pointing to Sirius, and you'd have the exact same thing where we know that it's it, it, it's old and we're told because of the alignments of the stars and the, the sphinx, the great sphinx in front of it, which, by the way, was recarved. It was never a pharaoh. It was a lion, just so we know. Later on, it was recarved. There's weathering all around the what's known as the Sphinx enclosure. And geologists like Robert Schock and other great minds like John Anthony West have gone in and they've studied the Sphinx enclosure. And instead of wind weathering, it's, it's very clear water weathering, very significant, like, like torrents of water had, had washed through on those areas, meaning that that had to have been built. If you look at climate records, when a time when great amounts of water were around in Egypt, when was that? The same time period that these stars aligned because of the procession of the equinox over 12,000 years ago. So we know, based on all these little pieces, that these civilizations were far more sophisticated and older than we're told. And these structures were built. Now, go ahead and go to that other image to add another layer to this. Before you move on that, so because of this, this cyclical equinox rotation, these stars, they're not currently in the same alignment than the image you're showing now, correct? No, so this image is actually not literal. What it's depicting is not only do were, were those shafts, the king and queen's chambers, we'll call them that shafts, chambers, pointing to those specific star constellations at a different time, but the three pyramids of Egypt, the great pyramids, were built as a literal representation of the three bell stars of Orion in the heavens, as above, so below. They were creating these structures not only to have specific spots on the Earth, but to literally mimic the locations of stars in the cosmos. Okay? It's wild. Yeah, okay, so go so ahead and bring that other image really quick. Welcome to the Valley of the Kings. The Valley of the Kings is that Lisa's been to um, is over 400 miles to the south of Giza. Now, why is that important? Because we know that every single pharaoh in Egypt was buried here. So then why are they telling us that the Great Pyramids were built as tombs for the pharaohs? It makes no sense. People aren't asking the right questions. This is where they were buried. We know that. This is why this structure exists. All the dynastic pharaohs were built here, meaning that it has nothing to do with the pyramids at all, and pyramids are not about tombs, and that's a very much a, a manipulation information. 
So uh, let's in the let's continue because I want to be able to have time for all these. So go ahead and go to number four too. So go back one image. Okay, this is so important for people to look at this. I cannot emphasize this enough. Remember cyclical, cyclical catastrophes on Earth. What you're looking at is a snapshot of the climate of the planet over the last twenty thousand years. We get this because it's derived from ice core samples that come from Greenland. Greenland is one of the most intact ice caps in the world. So what you can do is you can drill down through ice caps. You can then take those ice caps and analyze them based on the little bubbles of, of, of air in different, in different levels of carbon, all those things, carbon monoxide, and all those things that are within those areas. And you can measure what was the temperature and the climate like back then, okay? We're all told, hey, look, oh my God, the world is, it was so hot right now. It's never been this warm and all these things are going on. Look at where we are in the sheet. If people don't know, on the far right is our current time period, okay? It says present global warming. It almost isn't even distinguishable on this. Like it's, you can barely even see it, okay? And I'm not saying us polluting our world is good. That's not my message at all. I'm just showing you facts. Now look at what the climate was like 12,800 years ago, during the same time that Gobekli Tepe was being buried and all these, and these civilizations that we talk about around the world were all destroyed. We're talking about an over 1,000-year period of Earth history where catastrophes, climate change, and events were so severe that they literally caused the, the order of magnitude of temperatures on their planet to fluctuate in a level that we can't even comprehend. They have found mammoths in Siberia, the, one of the most um, the cold, resilient animals on Earth that have, were found frozen with undigested food in their stomach, okay? Meaning that those woolly mammoths, look at, the, look at the timetable right there on some of those temperature drops, those woolly mammoths froze to death instantly. Instantaneously. Yes. We're talking about climatic changes on our planet tectonic changes, volcanic changes, climatic changes that were so severe that it wiped out entire chapters of human history with civilizations that were so advanced and sophisticated that they knew all of every energetic point on the earth, the secrets to higher consciousness, to have humans reach their highest states, okay, left behind all these texts and all these things around the world, and then they just vanished and disappeared, okay? Now, more importantly, that we're, as we're going to show as we go along here, the structures we find, like in Baalbek, Lebanon, the Yangshan Quarry in China, and the unfinished obelisk in Egypt, those civilizations had reached the height of their sophistication, not the other way around, and then they just mysteriously vanished. Just gone. Can, can I ask one question for clarification yeah. uh, uh, on the stat up here, the far right, present global warming? You just said something, uh, you sort of skipped over it really quickly, but yeah. – we, we aren't helping the Earth's climate right now by cutting down all the forests and the ozone yeah, layer and all. I get all that. Yeah. But what I heard you say is the the idea of global warming, it's a cyclical thing. The planet for thousands yeah. of years goes yeah. through a cycle, warm, cool, exactly. warm, cool. And we have ice core records that reflect that scientific data that shows that we've had freezes and meltdowns, freezes and meltdowns yeah. multiple exactly. times. So. So just a question, why does the concept of global warming, why is it pushed so geopolitically so heavily all the time right now, just quickly? Two reasons. One, and one I very much agree with, yes, we're polluting the planet. It's not good for it. It's just enhancing a natural event. That, mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. We definitely need to go to renewable resources, look into Nikola Tesla technology if you don't believe that energy can be free. He but, was into, he was researching ley lines. That's Isn't that kind of going he knew, back? He that? knew what the ancients knew, okay? Yeah. And that can get it. That's actually what's going to get into when we talk about number 10. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so basically imagine. I'm like a kid in a candy thing. shop with you, just by the way. I'm just like, there's so yeah. much information. So imagine, now this is great. This is a great roundup of, of information. Imagine you had these cyclical events where the earth gets very cold and then gets warm over and over and over again. So when it gets cold, you get ice caps, the Laurentide ice sheet in the Northern hemisphere in North, Northern North America. And then the Eurasian ice sheets, they form and then the earth gets warm and then they melt. But guess what? Those events don't happen slowly. Like we're told those events happen like that. And you can have an entire ice cap with billions of tons of ice 
that can be liquidated in a very short amount of time, which is why during the last ice age, the megafauna across North America, like, right, the, the great tigers, the Siberian to tiger and the, the huge giant beavers and the, all the woolly mammoths and all those creatures, they all just disappeared. They disappeared because of this cycle. And that's the whole point to, is to come across is that they disappeared and also the ancient master civilizations disappeared as well. And so it has to do with a lot of comp complexity that has to do with salinity in the oceans and currents and s solar impacts on the earth and a whole variety of different things that go into how these events transpire. But that's, I just want to get this across that like what we're experiencing right now and all throughout our current human history is like nothing compared to what happened um, during what's known as the Younger Dryas, which is, which is the period of 11,000 to 13,000 years ago, which you can see on the chart there. Crazy. Okay. Next yeah, question. So we won't, we won't spend a ton of time on number five. Okay. I'll just, I'm going to briefly mention number and talk about number five. Yeah. Okay. So we are told uh, that one of the greatest philosophers in history, Plato, made up the entire story of Atlantis as just a metaphorical thing for our society. If you actually go do the research into where he learned that story, it'll blow your mind. So what happened was Plato's great mentor who was known as Socrates in, in, in ancient Greece. Okay. Socrates had connections and information with uh, another philosopher and Greek poet named Solon. Okay. Solon was like the first Greek philosopher and poet to travel to Egypt long ago before anyone else from the Western hemisphere and that part of the region was ever had ever visited there. And Solon ended up visiting a temple in Egypt known as the temple of Sais. Okay. He goes and he visits these temple priests and the temple priests of Sais go tell him, Solon, I want to tell you a story, an ancient story that needs to be known in case something happens and it's wiped out. It needs to be known by the world. He tells them, they the, uh, tell Solon that the earth has gone through great catastrophes on, in more times than we know, and that civilizations have risen up and been destroyed. He tells them the greatest civilization of all that ever existed in our entire history was known as Atlantis. And he goes in to tell him that they had the entire story written into that temple, the temple of Sais. Okay. And he tells him the whole story. These are temple priests that were like protecting one of the only places that had this knowledge left. And Solon takes that whole story of Atlantis where he had detailed descriptions of Atlantis, the, ri the circular rings of the great city. And it wasn't a single place. It was a civilization. That's what I want to get across. It was a civilization in the Atlantic. And he gave them very, very specific details that it, it existed in a place, probably somewhere near the Azor Islands, where you find three tectonic plates come together in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, okay? Three tectonic plates come together in one location there. And that, it, it, what's funny about that, or not funny, but interesting, is that the, the description of Atlantis is that it was destroyed and it submerged and was completely lost under the ocean. Well, if you have plates that are shifting in a place like that, you can get massive subduction, subduction of plates that can literally take up landmass and throw it down the bottom of the ocean. And that's exactly what Solon went back and told Socrates, and then Plato wrote the whole thing down, and that's how we know it, through what's called the Timius and Critias. And they had all kinds of details of this civilization that was completely destroyed in these catastrophes and wiped off the face of the map. And we now think of it as a myth. It'd be like if we disappeared and then another civilization came later and didn't think that we were real mm -hmm. and thought that we were just a myth. And I, and we don't, we don't need to go too far into that because we have a lot of other topics to cover. But basically, if you go read the Timius and Critias, they give detailed descriptions of that location and how not only was, do we think, like think of the Greeks, Plato and Solon, there, there was also a pre-Greek culture that existed before what we think of as the classical Greeks, just like these civilizations all around the world. Sumer, Japan, China, in parts of Asia, Turkey, and along the Mediterranean, Peru, through Mexico, the Maya even, the, the pre-Maya, the pre-Aztec, the pre um, the pre-Inca, there was all kinds of civilizations that existed there. They were all wiped out, and then other civilizations came and built in the same places. And we know that, because check this out, in Mexico, in the Yucatan, there's a temple called Uxmal, 
or a site called Ushmal. And there's a temple called the Temple of the Wizards. And the name Ushmal means built three times, meaning that that Mayan civilization that, that, that's credited with building there, they're the third version of that civilization that had rebuilt that temple over and over again. Three different versions. We see that all around the world, and that's the emphasis I want to get across, is that those civilizations, they try to pass on whatever they can, okay? And this is what's fascinating. Why, why did Egypt know about the story of Atlantis? Because the Temple of Sais was one of the, was one of the only temples that had survived with that knowledge because the entire Egyptian civilization, the Great Pyramids, was built because the sages and mystics of Atlantis, before it was going to be destroyed, went off to other parts of the world, like Egypt, to create in mystery schools and all these structures for multiple reasons, but to try to have the information carry on to the next civilization before their entire civilization was wiped out. And interestingly enough, the Temple of Sais was demolished by another empire later on and disappeared. And we only have descriptions of it when it existed. Think about like the Roman Empire came into Alexandria and burned the entire library to the ground. We lost all those records. That's what's happened over and over again when like the Roman Empire, very corrupt and terrible empire, decided to rewrite the entire message of history. That's where this corrupted story begins is because of the Roman Empire. That's a really interesting point, and we can we expound on that for a second. So when when there when a warring empire takes over another empire, they wipe out all the ideology and history that existed from the pro, from the culture they invaded, yes. so that they so that they can indoctrinate and raise the people of the empire that they just took over, so that there won't be any uprisings. The laws are changed, the rules are changed. They can rewrite the story, though. Rewrite they can everything. Rewrite the whole story. So that the younger, so that the younger generation that comes up is taught the new versions that that like in the case of the Romans that they're prescribing, correct? That's what exactly, and that's why in Mexico the flag of Mexico has is an eagle eating a serpent. That's ne- that was never an, an indigenous ancient civilization symbol. It has to do with an ancient war of empires around the world. The eagle has always been a war empire on every single, nearly every empire throughout history, and the serpent has always rep- represented knowledge and higher consciousness which goes back into the dragon, which is why Kukukan and Quetzalcoatl in Mexico were de- depicted as feathered dragons. And then you see dragons in China and Japan, and you see them depictions of the serpent all throughout Egypt and in Mesopotamia, because there was, there's these great secret societies and empires that have been battling throughout history to erase the other side, to rewrite the entire story. That's a conversation well for another story, but the eagle is actually on our uh, empire emblem, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Ready for the next question. So at the, out, at the outset of the call, you said that humans were considerably smarter than we that we're giving them credit for. And, and as far as 13,000 years ago, you have evidence to sort of prove that. So I'm going to go to the next slide Absolutely. for that. Yep. Ah, here we go. So people don't believe we're talking about those big blocks. Welcome to the stone of the pregnant woman in Baalbek, Lebanon. Okay. That stone remained unfinished and unmoved at the height of their sophistication, right? They were getting ready to move it and bring it somewhere. And then they just vanished. That stone weighs 1,100 to 1,200 tons. Okay. Now that's hard to put that into perspective, but that, that would be like putting, you know, countless 18 wheeler trucks or whatever you could in this massive pile. And you'd have to do the math. You'd have to do, well, you know, how much does like a a, a standard bus weigh or a sedan or like an 18 wheeler fully loaded. And then you'd have to do the math versus this being 1100 tons. And you could do, you could do the, try to calculate that. But we're talking about weights that are so massive that we could not move this stone today. We could not. And these civilizations were building massive temples. This is in, in a place called, below the temple of Jupiter, which the Romans built on top of, just like these other civilizations. The Romans are the ones credited in Baalbek, Lebanon, with the temple of Jupiter, which I don't have on here, but this is it's right next to This is the quarry of Baalbek, Lebanon, where they got the stones. But basically, they built right on top, and then our modern history books say that the Romans built it, okay? The Romans were the ones that built these. No, the Romans had no way, the capability to do this. We're talking about a civilization that was much more ancient and sophisticated that they just built on top of, just like so many others throughout history. 
So what you're looking at is if you go look up Baalbek Lebanon in the Trilithon block, which is bigger than this, you'll find that the lowermost base of that temple, just like this, had all these massive blocks, and then they, they built on top of it. How do you know that they were in the process of moving this somewhere? What's the scientific evidence on that? Because it hasn't gone anywhere. This is the quarry. This is the quarry where all these stones came from. And when you go and look at pictures of the Baalbek quarry, all these stones are like, un- they're half finished. They're like, they're, they're, they were ha- almost about Sorry, to be moved I missed that. Or, about, or about to be carved. And then all of a sudden they weren't. Like if you were to put this much work into something and then just abandon it, something very significant would, would have to happen for that to be the reason. And that, and that significant impact was that chart I showed you ago, a, a minute ago, which was that, that event that occurred between 11,800 years ago and 13,000 years ago with catastrophes that were so severe that it wiped these civilizations out. We're talking about tectonic plague and act- activity and volcanism and melting glaciers that would have literally created tsunamis around the world in, in events that are beyond our comprehension. So just for comparative purposes, I Googled to see what uh, was the equivalent of 1,000 tons, and it, it's equal to nine fully grown adult blue whales, just to put that in perspective. There you go. And that's the largest mammal on Earth. Yeah. That's right. Wow. So let's go ahead and go to the next one, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time here. Okay. Okay. Now, remember we talked about earlier on in the show, how do you leave a message behind? Right, you can. These blocks exist. Yeah, they, these megalithic blocks with precision exist all around the world. The pyramids do. That's great, but that doesn't actually leave a written message, or we can we can actually read. Welcome to the Ashurbanipal Library. People have heard of the uh, Library of Alexandria that the, that the Romans burned down, but almost never, no one's heard of this library. But this is the greatest library ever amassed in history. Okay, now. The remember how civilization emerged out of, the, out of the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, Iraq. Mm-hmm. Well, it did, but it emerged much earlier than we're told. Okay, and we're going to get into that in the next one. But more importantly, <clears throat> if you were going to leave a message behind, there's only one way you can do it, and that's what's so ingenious and sophisticated about these civilizations. You could either in stone or in clay, you could etch into something. Right, so it's embedded within it a message, and then you can fire the clay. In most places, that, in most cases, they use clay. There are stone, like the coat of Hammurabi, is a is a stone. What's known as cuneiform tablets. Okay, cuneiform writing. Now, <clears throat> what's wild about this is that <clears throat> this library, which is which is in the modern near what's today known as Mosul, Iraq, in the ancient city was known as Nineveh. Okay, back in the back back in the um, thousands of years ago. In 1849, specifically, these, these were buried though. But in 1849, a man named Austin Henry Laird did an excavation of that region. And they dug down and they found this library. Okay, a library with over 30,000 of these cuneiform tablets in it. Now, <clears throat> what's important to know about that is that they learned that this the 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 reason it was called the Ashurbanipal Library is there was a great king known as Ashurbanipal, and he realized that the information in these tablets, <clears throat> he didn't write them. He realized that it was so important that told, I'm talking about the entire story of where we came from, who we are, how old we are, where the influences came from. Everything was written in these tablets. More importantly, if you do research into, let me give you an example, Gobekli Tepe, that, that the astronomical um, stone circular temple we sh- I showed a minute ago. When they were, I'm just digressing, but I'll come back to this in a second. When they were digging down through the layers to, to uncover that temple, they found this record of what's happened over time. Right at the very lower most layers, they saw hunter and hunter gatherers, right, with primitive tools and in fires. But then something happened, like out of the blue. Within a very short time period in this in these soil samples, they saw agriculture and sophisticated civilization just emerge, like blossom out of nowhere. And that's why Gobekli Tepe was sub- subsequently built. That story, because remember, that's in the Fertile Crescent region. That's north of where this is. That story is is the, what's echoed here. If you look up where everything came from in our, in our civilization, everything, mathematics, metallurgy, animal hus- husbandry, astronomy, um, fermentation, um, agriculture, which is th- the, b- the blueprints of a civilization. You don't have agriculture, you will never have a civilization. You look at 
literally everything that makes up a component of our society, it all came from here. Iraq, all of it. It all came out of nowhere. And what do they tell you? They don't say that they discovered it. They don't say that at all. They talk about some kind of an influence long ago of what they called the Anuna, some kind of a group that came here. And, I, and, I, and we're not even going to go into the term alien because I hate the term aliens. I really don't like that term. And I don't think they are really aliens as we think. There's no ships that came here, nothing like that. We're talking about some kind of an incredible group of like multidimensional, some kind of an ins- gr- status beings that beyond our comprehension that knew everything that had the wisdom of the entire cosmos came here, created us in their image from this earlier primitive hominid. This is what everything states. This isn't me talking, go read the Atrahasis, go read the Enuma Elish, go read the myth of Adapa. They created us in their image and we became this sophisticated, incredibly highly conscious being. And then they gave us the knowledge to create civilizations, and they emerged all around the world. And then they, they went around, they taught all these things to civilizations. That's why those teachings stopped, and when those civilizations were wiped out by catastrophes, that's why they became primitive, because those influences no longer existed ever again. That's- and, 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 and I know you're not going to go down this the conversation because this would take forever, multiple episodes, but you just said created in his image, which sort of – the first Their first, image. When Their image. Their image. When you said that, the first thing that I heard you say, or at least most people hear you say, is a reference to the Bible because that's a reference created in His image. It is because and, the Bible was written from these tablets. All the, most of the information in the modern Bible came from these earlier sources, but it was rewritten in a different way. Context, crazy. So, um, you want me to continue? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so. Ashurbanipal, I'm going back again, a great king of, Mes- of, of Iraq, of the city of Nineveh, okay? He recognizes that the entire story of humanity, all of this is, is recorded in these tablets. He existed over 3,000 years ago, okay? And he even said that in his time, these were ancient, long before him. And he knew he was a priest also. He knew that he was an intellectual and he knew that these were important. So he sent out his armies to every corner of these ancient temples in the entire region. And they went and found every single tablet and they brought them back. And he created subsequently the greatest library in history known as the Royal Ashurbanipal Library. And that's what Austin Henry Layer discovered in 1849. And that's what this part of this exhibit is. This is only a little fraction of it, but here's what's wild about it. When they discovered in 1849, it's what's um, it's what's, it's a it's a dead language, cuneiform Sumerian Sumerian cuneiform is what's known as a dead language. And you have the Sumerians, you have the Akkadians, you have the Assyrians, you have the Babylonians. We're talking about multiple epics of civilizations that have been here. And here's what happened though: when they found these tablets, no one knew how to read them. No one knew how to read them at all because it's a language that had died out over a thousand years before, and nobody knew how to read it. Okay, it was it was a, it's a it's what's known as a and I'm studying how to how to actually read cuneiform. It's what's known as a language isolate, which means it's not shared in any singularities with any other languages in the world. It's like an alien language. Okay, and what the, what happened was it wasn't until the late 1800s, like 1878, that a man, a true hero of history, that I I will go to my grave making sure he's remembered. His name is George Smith. One of the greatest minds in history of our entire modern history. He spent years studying this, these, these, this, these cultures and studying these symbols. And that's the thing, is they had no alphabet. There was no cuneiform Sumerian alphabet, which is important because if you can figure out what the alphabet is, you can then figure out what the entire message is. They, ne- they had no alphabet. Every character had an individual character and a word meaning that was, that was unique. So it means you had to figure out every single word, okay? So George Smith, brilliant mind. I cannot emphasize it enough. He spends years reading these, years, cooped up in a library. And one day, he cracks the code. He figures it out. First person in in one, two thousand years to figure this out. And the first set of tablets he translates is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And then he subsequently translates on numerous others later. But here's the wild thing. 
is that those things that are kept in those tablets telling the entire creation story of us and how great gods came down and like created civilization and taught us all the knowledge. And that's why these megalithic civilizations and the sophistication of the pyramids and all this stuff is so crazy advanced because they were taught that now of those 30,000 cuneiform tablets, only a few hundred of them have ever been translated. And they remain in a dusty, mysterious attic, places like the Vatican archives and these secret locations around the world where they don't want people to know what's on them. So I can only get my hands, and this is my expertise and where I study is not just megalithic civilizations, but it's cuneiform tablets. I've spent years and years on this to figure out what the true story is. And we only have a couple hundred, if that, that has actually been translated. And they tell a, a completely different version of our story than we're told in school, completely different. So what happened to this historian? George Smith went on to live a good life, and he translated so many tablets, and he wrote one of my favorite books in history, which is known as the Chaldean Account of Genesis. And he is a genius in my mind. And then all other Assyri- – they're called the Syriologists because it's ancient Assyria. It's not called the Sumeriologists for some reason. But others came along the down the road like Samuel Kramer and Stephanie Daly staggered into the 19 19- um, 1950s up through the 1980s, and they took George Smith's work and they said, and they did their own translations and they matched it on like almost identically. They were all on the same page. It wasn't like they copied each other; they verified each other. So if you take these versions of these tablets, because people are automatically be like, "Well, how do you know they they t- they translated them correctly?" You simply take the greatest researchers in history that have studied this, not Sitchin. Do not read Zechariah Sitchin. Sorry for anyone that's going to be offended by that. But take these other translators, George Smith, Samuel Kramer, Stephanie Daly, and a few others, and you can cross-reference their versions, and you get to find out the story of everything. Wait, why not Zachariah Sitchin? Because I have read him. Why do you say that? He is not a cuneiform expert. He did not. He had no training in this at all. Hmm. His his I've I've calculated that's because that's where I started too. I became obsessed with this. I wanted to know the truth. I've calculated his translations are twenty to thirty percent accurate. Oh wow. Can you can you just describe to me what we're looking at in this picture? I know you're saying they're records. Like, what's the yeah. size of them? What would they look like if you could like hold them or see them or be yeah, face to face with them? Sure. So these are fragmented pieces because they're so ancient. Okay, we're talking about we're talking about pieces that are like this this big to this big to this big that are all like pieced together. And this is in the British Museum, and you can go visit this today. You can see this exhibit, but again, it's only one little fraction of it of what actually was found. And so, so hang, on, hang on a second. So, cause some people just listen audio. When you say this big, you're talking a few inches, six inches, eight inches. Yeah, so you're talking um, a few inches to six inches to up to like 10, 12 inches. Um, cause they're fragmented. So they, they, that's the other trouble is they found a bunch of these all jumbled and broken cause clay breaks and they had to try to fit them all back together. And so we get when, when the problem is you start to read these from the translators and they'll just trail off and be like tablet fractured and broken message unknown. And then you like have to try to fill in the blanks, be like, you know, Matt went blank to blank a walk or something like to take a, you know what I mean? You have to try to fill in like, well, what is that story trying to say? Because it's broken and dis- and, d- and destroyed over time. But I want to emphasize that what they have in here is amazing. They talk about these cycles. They talk about catastrophes. They talk about wiping out civilization here. They talk about how these creator gods knew about these cyclical catastrophes and they allowed them to wipe everyone out because certain things had happened. And there's a, there's a particular tablet I want people to read called the myth of Adapa that goes into how the perfect, the perfect human was created known as Adapa, which was the later biblical term known as Adam or Adamu was his original name. But Adapa was the same individual, and he was created in perfection. And I mean perfection like in the image of these creators. That's what you want to call them. That's why I want people to get away from this, dry away from the term alien and ships. None of that happened here. There's The universe is much more sophisticated and amazing than we know. Go ahead. Can I ask a question about that? So this cyclical effect where the, the earth basically recycles itself every 13,000 years, do you suspect that's, that's by infinite design, or is that... Is that part of a larger picture of the universe? It, I don't really understand the cause and effect it's behind that. It's really, really complicated. And it's interesting because there's a tablet, there's a set of tablets called the Enuma Elish, mm-hmm. where it discusses how they may have p- played a hand in that. 
And that goes, that goes down to a completely another rabbit hole on why that they would want that. But we're going to get into that on, on number 10. So don't, so don't worry. Okay. So, but I want to leave everybody with understanding that we were created in perfection. I can tell you, i give you an example of evidence that shows that. Okay. If, if all of this is through Darwinism here, through natural evolutions on this planet, right? Take a human, for example, and people might not know this, and it's important that they look into this. Human beings, the whole, the, the symbol of the serpent, right? Why was the serpent shown and the serpent, and the dragon shown in these civilizations all around the world? It, it, it represents knowledge, but it represents something much greater than that. It represents the kundalini spiral energy up our spinal cord of energy that exists within the human body that then fosters higher consciousness where we can literally become like gods, like them, become as they are, okay? If we have the right way, the right teachings, which is why these great sages and mystery schools will go out to these various places and, and find initiates that were different, that could, that could be open-minded and, and intelligent enough to be able to follow these ancient teachings. And they, what's fascinating about that is within that energy center, which is what, why it's why it's a serpent, because it's a coiled energy center within, our, within us, is what's known as the chakra centers, Okay. The chakra centers represent these seven centers of energy, these almost like um, ley line convergence zones of the earth. That's why we're like created in perfection with the earth. The earth has got like 72% water. We have the exact same amount of water in our body. We have like the same iron in our blood, like the iron that spins the core of the earth. And also we have these convergence zones of energy known as chakra centers, just like the planet. That's what's wild about what we are and how important we are and more than we're told. These chakra centers, this is what gets even crazier. The vibrational frequency of these chakra centers, we have seven of them, exactly mimic, exactly mimic the color, the seven colors of the visible light spectrum. Okay. So you go outside, you're taking a walk and it starts raining, right? And then the sun comes out and it shines and you see a rainbow and you see all the, the seven colors of the rainbow in that order. That's the exact order that our chakra centers through the, the color, but also color is frequency is exactly mimicked in that within us. We're like light beings. We've been created in perfection for this planet to be like these interpretations of light itself. That's why when people, great ascended masters throughout history, go through these teachings and they learn all this, all of a sudden they become truly conscious and wise and you go near them and you're like, wow, your energy is amazing. Like, what have you been doing, right? And then that's what that is. They're literally, there's an aura of energy that they're creating that is basically unlocking the highest potential that, that exists within us. And that's why civilizations were created with all those teachings and then they became corrupted all around the world and destroyed. That's the highlight I want to point out about this. At the end of the show, before you jump, I, I, I would like to get your take on what's the point of all this. So you know all this information. You researched all this. Great. Why does it matter? And what's the point of us being here then? But they don't answer that now. That's yeah, that sounds like a really easy question to answer. Well, I'd like to <laughs> answer. Do you want to wait till the end to answer? Let's that. get to the end because I know we, I know you don't only have a limited amount of time. So yeah, we're, 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 we're a good show. Let's keep going. So let's go to the next one. Oh, um, did actually, I go forward too far? No, uh, no. Um, go back to that. Okay, um, this is the the slide that I meant to talk about all those things that we were just talking about. On this is the Assyrian Tree of Life mural that came from the Ashurbanipal Library in the, in his library. Okay, this is so important because it's the totality of everything that I just discussed with you. Okay, they're called the Anuna gods. That's what they call them, which means those from heaven came to earth. Okay, that's what, and they call themselves that as well. Now, look at this depiction. I want to explain it for a minute. You have the tree of life in the center, okay, and then you have the winged god in the in the middle, which is like I think is really like the actual creator of the whole the, the entire universe, okay. And then you have two individuals in the middle, and then two individuals on the outside, okay. Now, the individuals on the outside have wings, okay. That's the Anuna gods you're looking at what they're talking about in those. And I mean, I looked it up once the term Anunnaki or Anuna is mentioned in like 27 different tablets that I've got my whole, a hold of they're everywhere. They are the whole description of how all this got started. And they're the ones who say that we're the, we're, we are the creators of civilization. 
Are there, ref- are there references of these Anuna gods that have been, we may have just glossed over in the, in the narrative of the Bible? Yeah, they're just what the angels are. Like, in, in, like Archangel Michael and all those are the same thing. Okay, so wings means an ascended being. Wings are not literal. We have to be very careful to take literalism and symbolism. Very important to understand that. They created these in, these incredible symbols around the world in the megalithic structures, dragons, and things like this for those who are initiates who can understand it. If you take it literally, you will not understand it. That's the whole purpose. Everything, most things in this are symbolic, but some things are literal. So where is the truth? Symbolic, literal, right about in between. That's where I want to strongly emphasize. So the wings just represent them being like ascended masters, great ascended beings of the universe. Now look at what they're doing here, okay? Notice how the the individuals in the middle look like the other ones because they're literally the, the children of them with their bloodlines, which is why they're chosen to rule because they are simply like children of them, okay? Now look at how... Look at what the two figures on the outer end are doing compared to the two in the middle. So you have one of them is holding a pine cone, and then one's holding a handbag, okay? The pine cone represents the seeds of knowledge. Remember, it's a tree of life, right? So they're passing on the seeds of knowledge. What, is this, what are the seeds of knowledge? How to, how to create agriculture, mathematics, astronomy astrology, um, everything for a civilization, knowledge of the cosmos, everything is, is, is contained in that, even war, even the knowledge of war. And there's other depictions that show eagle-headed versions of them passing on the knowledge of war. We, that's a whole no, that's a that has to do with like a mentality thing, okay, but that's a whole nother conversation. So so real quickly, there's a pine cone in the middle of Vatican City. Yes, there is. So the pine cone was metaphorically bastardized and adopted by Christianity or yes. Catholicism or religion. What? Uh, what yes. Sorry, I, I need to understand that connection. Okay, for so the Pope wears a, a hat. That's was literally the ancient miter hat in these civilizations. It's the same thing. They they are just mimicking. It's a corrupted version of these original individuals, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get into how that plays in in this mural too. Okay. So. The, the, the pine cone represents a passing of knowledge, and the handbag represents they, them having the totality of all knowledge. So the pine cone symbolically comes out of the handbag to show that they have all the knowledge, and they're passing it on to very specific individuals. Go ahead. Okay, I have to ask a question because I see this in a lot of these murals. They're holding bags all the time in a yes. lot of the different architecture. Yes, exactly. So the bags represent what? The bags represent the keepers of knowledge. So if you, like, this is in Mesopotamia. This is the mural from the Ashurbanal Paul Library. You see the same depiction of the handbag and pine cone in the Olmec culture in Mexico. You see it all the, throughout South America in Mexico. You see it in Mesopotamia. You see other similar depictions, like, all around the world. And it shows that the same influences of these original progenitors went around the world and created civilizations everywhere. It's the same thing. It's what is shown all around the world, and it's what is basically depicted of that. Um, so there. So look how there's two on either end. Now look at the two individuals in the middle. One of them it has a staff, right, and a rod. So one of them is a priest, and one of them is a king. Okay. So, so, so this one is the staff. That's what you're saying, correct? Yes. So the masculine rod of ruling, and then you have a priest, basically. Um, Sitting, sitting next to them. So they're showing that the totality of how a society is governed and ruled, it's known as kingship. A king is told all the knowledge to rule over that segment. And then a priest is given all the knowledge to, to basically be in charge of religion. So you have the kingship and the, and the religious aspect that come together to be the hierarchy to rule over all of society. And that's what those two depictions are, is a king and a priest being taught all the knowledge to literally create civilizations and to be like the great wisdom keepers of their, that's why they were so obsessed with these gods all throughout history. It was, it was, it was literal. It was literally, there was like, they were actually being given information on, on only a higher level by them. And that's why eventually they left. You can actually read in 
in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and people think it's all parables and all that stuff. No, no, no. Go look at the section where um, Gilgamesh meets um, Untanapishtim to, to learn the secrets of immortality. And he tells them, he says, Gilgamesh, I'm going to tell you an ancient story, a, a city so old that it was from a different time period, basically. He says the gods were once in it. And then the deluge, the destruction came through and they left. They didn't come back. That's why knowledge is disintegrated and just been destroyed over time because they felt so bad about allowing the catastrophe 13,000 years ago that we almost literally were like completely reset or we were reset, but we almost didn't even make it. Um, and they, they felt guilty of that because they are our creators. I've heard you talk about, and I'm not going to go down this channel with you, but I've heard you talk about in some of your early shows on the Inuna, and there was, and I'm, I'm probably going to bastardize the names, but Inlil, Inky, yeah, and, yeah. and there was sort yeah. of a, there was sort of a division between these creators, and one was yeah. supporting humanity's continuation, and one was not. Yeah, and and that's a conversation that's for another time. But in a, in a in a quick recap, what does that have to do with what we're looking at here, if, if any? Okay. So they're not actually, this isn't specifically supposed to be like Enki and Enlil. What it really represents is more of just like a higher view of them passing knowledge. But however, we got to remember there's fundamental constants that exist in the universe. And one of them is duality. Mm. Polarity and duality means you have to have, you have to have what we perceive as like dark and light or good and evil on either sides. And these beings were literally playing and representing those archetypal roles in the universe. And it became... That's why they, in, in biblical terms, they call it like a war in heaven. It was simply just a war of these creators over how sophisticated and, and what our path should be and how some of them thought that we, we should never have existed in the first place. Hmm. One final question before we move into the next one. Are there any parallels between the handbags these people are holding in this mural here versus you see a lot of times in modern astronauts who are getting ready to board a ship? They're always carrying something. And I seem to recall you talking about something once, but I don't remember what that was. Is there any no, parallel? I, I think that's looking at something too literal because, okay. remember, they were never carrying any of this stuff. They didn't Understood. have a pine cone in their hand. They didn't have a handbag. No, no, no. None of that was real. It was all symbolic. Understood. It was okay. all just them showing the passing of knowledge and how they're the keepers of knowledge essentially try to be careful with literalism versus symbolism okay does any of this translate over into when you're saying that this is found basically around the world into egyptian hieroglyphs or anything like that it, like this symbolism. similarities to it like for instance we find the cobra on the forehead of the ancient pharaohs representing the third eye and representing that they had the knowledge so it's there it is a similar depictions but not quite the same thing but they're similar in some ways Go, go ahead and go to the next one because we're going to have to um, – yeah, we're going to have to keep moving because we have two more to go. Now, I don't want to stay in this too long. We've talked about this, but basically I spent months and months taking every piece of knowledge that I had, studying all these ancient civilizations, and I created my own timeline on when I think all of these events occurred and when the first Adapa was created and when – these ancient Sumerian cities existed and when the pyramids were built and when the Indus Valley civilizations created things like Kanhari caves and Bara Bara caves and Elora caves and when, the, when Gobekli Tepe was built and when the pre-Incan Olmec existed. Again, all these things. I tried to stagger and create them and when those cyclical catastrophes of the Younger Dryas were. So this is, um, people can find this on my website, thestageoftime.com and I have a, this color image there. Go ahead and check it out, and it's something that is being um, worked into the new book I'm writing with Billy Carson called The Epic of Humanity, and it's going to be telling this lost story. But again, I want people to go look at this on their own. It's going to take us too long if we try to break all this down. But this is basically just like a snapshot of where I think all these things lined up based on the evidence. All right. Okay. Did I, did I miss the slide? No, we're, we're good. We're on the last one, and now... And again, we can get into as detailed as this, um, you know, we let's, we have like, you know, 10 minutes, we, we should probably wrap it up. Okay. But, um, so why is this happening? These cyclical catastrophes? Why? Okay. I want to point out and announce, uh, and I've never announced this before. So you guys are getting a special announcement that no one knows. So I hope you, you like that. Um, the greatest project that I'm ever going to take on that I've, that I've taken on so far in all my work. The, the work, the, the book I'm doing with Billy is, is incredibly important, but the next one that I'm going to be doing is going to take years and it's going to be the composite, the 
compiling and the research of everything that's come, the totality of everything that I've figured out. And it, what it is, is I'm going to call the next book that I'm going to write is going to be called The Dead Star and Fall of Civilizations. And that it's going to be the um, what I consider the greatest project that I've ever taken on. And it's going to be a very challenging one. And what I basically have found that not many researchers have connected is that unlike um and and this isn't this isn't a dig on some of the other um alternative researchers i have enormous amounts of respect i just want to point out for graham hancock and Randall carlson and um just so many others that that have this this belief that these cyclical catastrophes are from cosmic impacts okay love all their research love all that i don't agree with that at all though there's only one researcher that disagrees with that, and his name is Robert Schock, and I, I want to point him out. Now, he has basically pointed out, hey, no, no, no. We think that, I think this might be more related to like a coronal mass ejection from the sun. I've taken it a step further. And so I want to just – I'm just going to briefly explain this a little bit for people to understand. Um, when NASA was looking at our solar system in the 1970s, they discovered that the outer planets in our solar system, Uranus and Neptune, are tilted on their axis. Not only that, but the entire solar system is tilted. It's all slightly tilted on its axis. And they were like, what is going on? Why? Well, what, what's, the, what's going on with that? And so they sent out um, two probes, known as Pioneer 10 and 11, in 1983. Now, Pioneer 10 went off a certain direction, and Pioneer 11 did. Pioneer 11 didn't find anything. Pioneer 10 found the greatest secret that has that no civilization really has like put together to then find a solution for like like we did because again this technology hasn't been available i don't think we ever had probes to send out like we did now i think i think they knew about it but they didn't know in the degree of of that we we, we figured out so they sent out pioneer 10 and if people want to understand this whole thing, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta stop and just and and point something out. If you go look up Pioneer Ten right now, you'll see that the internet has been scrubbed ev everywhere. You can't find anything on Pioneer Ten. You'll find about when it was launched, and you'll find that it went out to explore the solar system, but you won't find anything on what it found, because what it found was the great secret to all of this, the great, the greatest secret ever, ever kept. What they found was that, and I and I want to point out that I have a high definition, high resolution image of what that Pioneer 10 Pro found because I was able to dig it up with another couple of researchers long ago, where there was only one place. Why don't we have that picture? I know <laughs> um, there was only one place that the Pioneer 10 data was ever kept in, in and shown to the world. And it was known as the 1987 Science and Inven Invention Encyclopedia. And back then, encyclopedias were the norm before the internet. And they simply pu published a diagram of what it found, but the description mentions nothing. And that's what's so wild about it. It's like, so, okay. So they were told not to say anything about it, but the diagram was still published. I have the only high-resolution image that I've ever found from that that I was able to dig up through extensive, extensive searching. And it's on my website, thestageoftime.com, on the main page. I highly recommend people go and see that because it's going to blow your mind. Now, what it found, it's it went out. So imagine the solar system as um, there's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and then you go out through Uranus and Neptune, and then you have Pluto way out there, right? And then you have the sun. And then there's what's known as the Kuiper Belt, this massive circular belt of asteroids and comets that exists around what's known as the inner solar system. But there's a whole other aspect of our solar system called the outer solar system that plays major roles in this whole thing. And what – so Pioneer goes out. It goes through the Kuiper Belt, and it, it whisks its way off, and it discovers two massive objects. And I, when I mean far out, we're talking about three to four times – further than Pluto is, okay, and Pluto's way out in the middle of nowhere, they found a planet, okay, that is four to five times the size of Earth. And you can go look that up on NASA in like 1993 or 1991. They actually announced that. They announced that they found a planet in the outer solar system that's four to five times the size of Earth. 
They actually said that in the press, a press um, announcement, and then it just kind of disappeared when Robert Harrington and Thomas Van Flanden, who were uh, astronomers, were investigating this and mysteriously both died. Yeah. And then the whole thing was buried. And then other um, astronomers came on and said that they, everything they did was mathematical calculations, and everyone's like, okay, that's fine, that makes sense. Whereas Caltech University has been doing studies where they're studying the Kuiper belt and they found that objects are all tilted, even out there from, from something out beyond it. Okay. So what did Pioneer 10 find? It found a planet that exists far out there, not Nibiru, a planet though, that they termed planet nine or planet 10, depending on what you want to call it, way out revolving around its own star. Okay. But not remember the title of my book. Not a normal star, a dead star. What that means is if you have a dead star, and they knew that because they were able to measure the, the frequency, the light coming from this star, which isn't really anything, but they were able to determine that this star had lost nuclear fusion and it exploded. And it was just a remnant of this star, but it's, high, it's got massive density. It's still a massively dense object, okay? It didn't turn into a black hole. It turned into what's called a dead star. And in that depiction on my website, for Pioneer, the data from that encyclopedia, they label it as a dead star. They say that it's 50 billion miles out. 50 billion miles out. So far, and has no light, has no signature. It's not a brown or red dwarf. It's a dead star which means it exploded long ago in history, which makes me wonder if it was actually part of some of the, the heat that was around during the dinosaur period, but that's 60 million years ago, but that's another whole conversation. But this star exploded and then had an, has an orbit, right? What happens is the orbit is exactly 13,000 years on perihelion on when it gets closest to our sun. So imagine a, a highly, Im incredibly dense object, and this is what the whole book's going to be about, highly dense object that every 13,000 years, perihelion means the closest approach to our sun. Mm -hmm. It means the whole, the whole entire um, rotation of this object is 26,000 years, the exact same number as the precession of the equinox. It's the reason that our entire solar system is functioning the way that it does. So every 13,000 years, imagine this object, this incredible dense dead star approaches our our sun and our sun tries to maintain what's known as equilibrium and it the energy comes in and affects it and the, the only way for this our sun to not explode is it has to send out energy so every thirteen thousand years it sends out a massive plume of charged particles that go throughout the entire solar system and then they hit the earth the poles on the earth wobble and move and they set off every single tectonic plate on the entire planet Holy every shit. volcano every tectonic plate and they cause tsunamis that are like a mile high that travel around the world and are more than a mile high and literally destroy every single civilization over and over again and they bring on their own climate changes that's why ice ages develop because as that dead star goes goes what's known as aphelion away from our sun it gets cold again and then an ice age develops on the earth. And then as it gets closer to the earth, all that heat from our sun, as it comes out, warms our, our climate. Because we're talking about an, an event that is like extremely long, like well over a thousand years. And the period of as it's getting closer and going away is thousands of years. So that's why you get this rise and fall of these temperatures in glaciation and then non-glaciation over and over again on the planet. It's from the interaction of this dead star. That's that's what the, the greatest secret that I've never talked about in that way before that to share with, with your audience tonight. Well, thank you for dropping that. So can I just, in my layman terms, you talked about massive tsunamis, floods, mile high tsunamis. Is that the story of the epic that ended in, you know, the Bible, Noah's Ark, et cetera? Is that where you're going yeah. with that? Yep. So imagine a flood being caused from tectonic plate activity. That's what destroyed Atlantis. That's where all this has come from. Okay. It's all from the same thing that happens over and over again. And that's why those civilizations built the pyramids in the location that they did so that they could try to prevent and harness and balance the energy of the earth so that they could prevent these events, but they weren't able to. Those structures are built in specific locations to try to balance the, the en electromagnetic energy of the planet, but they couldn't do it. It like literally blew them open. And so we, there is, we're going to get, I'm going to get into this in the book, but the greatest secret besides that 
is that the Nikola Tesla technology that's being used, they're, they're down in Antarctica right now with governments all over the world creating an artificially created um, electromagnetic system, a giant magnet of energy to try to tilt the earth in the opposite direction to try to prevent when this, this, this dead star comes through, they're able to prevent the poles from shifting by all creating it like their own, um, their own like artificially magnetic, um, magnetic technology that they're, they're using to basically prevent for the first time in human history, I believe our destruction secretly so that nobody knows about it, which is what the whole purpose of all the secrecy in Antarctica. And that's why it's a no fly zone and nobody can go over there. Yeah. Man. So at the outset of the show, you said that's the that's the secret that we should be able to technically stop this if we have the information and we use it properly. Exactly. That we're the we are think people like Nikola Tesla who figured out what the ancients already knew, but then we took it to the next level and we have the technological means to prevent our own destruction for the first time in our entire story. So if that rings true, then the paradigm of persistent digression of evolution and our technology could stop and reverse and go the other direction, which is exactly. the whole point of us being here in the third dimension to yep. collectively learn to evolve as a species. So the information that we take and the technology that we learn, we can then begin to ascend back up the other side of the ladder. Exactly. And for the first time we can take all, think about it. Gobekli Tepe was buried until we discovered it only in 19, 1995. Meaning we're not only taking what we've accomplished, but everything that we've that's been left behind from all the civilizations that sacrifice themselves to give us the knowledge to allow us to reach this point of understanding and technological means for us to go somewhere that we've never been able to go in our entire story. So my question before you answered all that was, great, we know all this, now what? So the point is so that we have this information so that we can collectively add to this exacerbation of us growing not digressing but we're just lay people we don't have access to antarctica we're not part of the history we're not part of the research so what's our role versus the okay. elites that are running everything great question is knowledge and raising the consciousness on the entire planet we all have an effect on each other and the, it, we, it's not what we think like imagine you know the depictions of a of a, of a buddhist monk mm -hmm. sitting on top of a mountaintop meditating he's projecting out his consciousness to the world we are all those creators of higher consciousness that are part of a, what's known as co-creation all the humans on the earth we've never had eight billion people here ever before and we have the technology to prevent this imagine eight billion co-creators all coming together with their consciousness and raising it up to a certain vibrational level. We're literally going to evolve our consciousness to the next stages, as well as having the technological means to prevent our own destruction. What do we become? We become gods. We become like creator gods. We don't even understand it. We are so much more advanced than we're told, and we have the ability to reach something that I don't think anyone even knows what that is. Something multidimensional. Something, that is, something that's beyond the physical form. So this question is probably going to take hours to respond to because there's so many different ways you could take this. But the current state of affairs seems to be a maelstrom of chaos. And, and from, from my unbiased perspective, it seems like there is a purging, a purposeful purging of people. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting I know the answers to this. But the people who are building this information and building this technology know about everything and, and the way they can change this and reverse the, the paradigm that we've been talking about. Are they trying to hold and hoard this information for a select group of people? Yes. yes. And, I don't, and I don't want to go too far down that yeah, road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Sorry. People, but I'll just tell you that the global elites, most of the things that we see around the world, major large scale of things are always planned. It's always some kind of a, like like a, ch a strategic chess match. Yeah, it's a chess match, and um, so these are, I'm not going to mention what the events are, but you look at where we are in the world, and there's these different strategic things that happen. Then they start to die off, and then another one emerges like out of nowhere. Yeah. Okay, those are just tools to try to keep our consciousness in a state of fear. Because fear is a way to keep you in the lowest state of consciousness possible to prevent 
they don't want the the masses of humanity reaching those higher stages and stages of consciousness becoming enlightened and learning the whole thing because then the the whole puppet show's over it's there is darkness that exists there are there are bad people that are still in charge of certain things here yes they may be preventing our own destructions through their own selfish means but in the end it's all going to work in the way that it's supposed to and have faith in something much greater than us in them in this story, because remember, the Maya prophesized, like other civilizations, long ago, that this was the version that was going to make it. How would they have known that, unless this is the one that was destined to make it? So understand that all the darkness and all the evil that exists here today, it's simply a shell of something that's playing a part that doesn't even know the part it's playing. But honestly, our future is guided by something much higher than that. And we are destined to have this be the version that makes it into the infinite. And so I want people to be positive and resonate with that and not be fearful and scared and understand that this is the greatest time in all of human history to be alive. I love that ending. Wow. Any questions? I'm blown away. Matt, I know you have blown away. I know you don't have any more time to talk. I, I we didn't even get into the, my other questions from your book that I wanted to ask. So it's okay. I, we can do another time though. I, I would love to. Thank you for this knowledge drop, really. That's and thank you. <laughs> and thank you for ending on a positive note for those who have been listening along. And just unraveling it in such a way that it just it just flowed from one thing to the next that really, you know, made it much more easier to digest and to resonate on later we'll be up all night talking about i this. told you how he breaks it down yeah. it just makes it sense it mm-hmm. makes sense doesn't it mm-hmm. okay my mind is stirring <laughs> right now thank you matt i really cool. appreciate your time and the energy no, no and, and the impact that you've made on this conversation and i'm grateful for it and hey thanks i enjoyed talking to you guys it was a really really nice conversation appreciate it all right all the best to you i'll be in touch with you thank you thank you again